Proverbs 30, verse number 4. Very interesting scripture back here. Seems like we kind of forget about it, but it's got a lot in it. Look what it says in verse 4 and 5 and 6. It said, Who hath ascended up into heaven or descended? Who hath gathered the wind in his fist? Now, we know what the answer that's going to be, right? We know what the answer that is. Who hath ascended up to heaven or descended? Who hath gathered the wind in his fist? Who hath bound the waters in a garment? Who hath established all the ends of the earth? What is his name? Notice this. And what is his son's name, if thou canst tell? Then watch the Lord pull a fast one on us, and notice what he says. You say, it says, what is his name, and what is his son's name? Now understand, this is Old Testament, but it has prophecies about Jesus Christ and about what he was going to do all through there. What's his name that did this? What's his son's name? And look at the answer. Verse 5, every word of God is pure. But he is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. Add thou not to his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. Isn't it interesting that the answer to this, when he gives the question, what's his name, and what's his son's name, he doesn't say God the Father and God the Son. You know what he says? He said, every word of God's pure. And don't add to his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. Isn't that something? I hope you're getting what I'm, are you seeing what I'm seeing? This don't seem to add up. But I want to show you from Scripture today what the Bible says about the Bible. Y'all started this, so I got to kind of finish what y'all started. I love that little thing they got out on the back deal, and this baseball card, I like sports just a little, kind of runs in our family or something, and, and, but to put the Bible on those baseball cards and try to be able to get that and break that down and find anything I can get, any kind of motivation I can get to read my Bible a little better, a little faster, a little more, I want it, amen? Good stuff, and I like what you're doing. But then we, we heard on the phone, maybe I didn't hear right, but um, Brother Dave said, we need you to come, and we can't do the Bible school this year. But, uh, man, it's just the way it is out here. But I tell you what, Brother Freddie, we want to do like a one-day Sunday revival. I said, a what? He said, I want you to come and do a one-day Sunday revival. And I told him, I didn't know what he was talking about. You're going to preach twice, and everything, the kids sing and everything is quote scripture, please do. And I asked my kids about it, I said, uh, he said, and then we, they was looking at it, and they heard it yesterday, announced we're going to have a revival. And, and my kids, I said, what did he say? And they said, a revival. We're going to have a one-day revival. Little David said, it's a revival. And little, little Abby said, it's a revival. And, and Catherine said, it's a revival. And Andrew, I think he talks a little better, but he said it's a revival. I don't know about you, but it sounds like to me, Brother Dave, you know, he's already been on a tear this spring. We've been getting his stuff to streaming and YouTube and all that and on this King James thing. Man, it's pretty cool. I said, man, and my wife, she heard it. We've listened to several of them. There's 13 of them I know, and I was listening to one yesterday, and I asked my wife, she said, man, this is good. We need to get our kids to sit there so they know what they believe and what, you know, why they believe it. huh? We need to get them to sit down and hear this whole series. And, and, and so I said, did he say what I thought he said? He wants to have a one-day revival? And, I, and, and so uh, my kids said, it's a revival, Dad. You need to have a revival. On one day, we're going to, hey, so I want to preach this morning on this subject, uh, King Jesus and the King James Bible. How you like that? They go together. They go together. King Jesus, I'm not trying to say this with any respect, disrespect. I'm not trying to do that. King Jesus and our King James Bible. And I want you to look with me just today at Scripture and notice how these two work together and how close they are. I'm not just saying any old book out there. And any old thing, you can't judge a book by its cover. Any old thing that calls itself a Bible may not be. But I'm talking about this old King James Bible and King Jesus. I want to preach to you on this subject this morning. 
I don't know if you know it, but uh, if you, if, and you may not get turned all this, you might want to just write them down or think about them, meditate on this, and think about it as, as you go home later to, in a little bit. But Psalm 33, 6, you know what it says? It says, By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the host of them by the breath of His mouth. Did you know how you got created? You got created by that Bible you're holding in your hand or in your lap if you got the right one. That book created you. You wouldn't be here if it wasn't for the Bible. Huh? You wouldn't. And, God, you, know, and you read Genesis 1, you get that. First rattle out of the box. And God said, and God said, let us make man in our own image. All that time, them six times. Hey, he, and God said, or you wouldn't be here. Nothing in your world would be here if it wasn't for that book. So it's created, the Word of God created you. But wait a minute, I thought it said in Scripture, I thought it said Colossians 1.14, we know that, you know this verse, in whom we have redemption through His blood, talking about Jesus, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. It says, for by Him were all things created, by Jesus, that are in heaven, that are in earth, whether they be thrones, dominions, principalities, powers, they are created by Him, and for Him. Isn't that right? How many of y'all believe that God made you? Hey, do you know what it says says in Genesis 1-1? But what about John 1-1? It says, in the beginning was the Word. Now this is a capital W. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. Three times it's a capital W in that verse. And, and, And all things were made by Him. And without Him was not anything made that was made. And it tells you who that word is that made you. That it was for everything. In, in John 1, 14, it says, And the Word, capital W, that's Jesus, was made flesh and dwelt among us. Stay with me. And we beheld His glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Hey, that word, capital W, you ought to capitalize somebody's name. But did you get that? It's Jesus' name. It's the Son of God's name. Is the word, the capital W, is Jesus' name. And yet the little W in Scripture, you know, Romans 10, 17, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. That's a small W. But they both have the same name. Did you get that? Both of them, King Jesus and that Bible, have the same name. They're both called the Word. God don't just go around calling people that for no reason. They're close. Stay with me. Hey, did you know you said, well, I knew God created me. I knew the Bible was involved. I know that. I understand this about Jesus is the Word, capital W, and the Bible is a small... I understand that, Brother Reed. What about this? Hebrews 7.25, it says, Wherefore He, talking about Jesus, wherefore He is able to save us. Uh, uh, save them that come to God by, by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for us. He, that wherefore he's able to save us to the uttermost that come to God by him. How many of y'all believe that Jesus saved? How, how many of y'all believe he saved? How many of y'all he saved you? Raise your hand this morning. I got saved, and Jesus is the reason, man. He took my place on that cross. I should have been there. He took my place, died for me, and suffered in my place. And I took him as my Savior, and I'm saved. How many of y'all, you believe Jesus saved? It's in our song, but it's all through the Bible. Listen to me. Did you know the Bible also says in James 1, verse 21, it says, receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls? Hey, I thought it said Jesus saves you. Nobody would argue that if they know have any sense, one eye and half sense. They know Jesus saves. But wait a minute. That same Bible says that His Word saves you and you ought to receive it. Isn't that something? That's interesting. When you got, you, when you, when you got saved, you did it by receiving Jesus Christ. Listen close. You receive Jesus Christ or you ain't saved. Stay with me. We're going to talk a little bit more about this tonight, just a little bit, about what it means to the believer now that you will have him inside. Listen close. But it says, He came into His own, John 1, 11, and His own received Him not. That's the Jews. But as many as received Him, I'm glad I got in on that number. 
As many as received him, John 1, 12, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believed on his name, which were born not of the will of the flesh or the will of man. They were born of God. You know how you got born again? You got born again by receiving Jesus Christ. That made you a child of God. How many of y'all know that? You believe that? Okay, stay with me though. You receive Jesus Christ. You get your new birth by receiving Jesus Christ. But what does Peter say in 1 Peter 1.23? He says, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, that liveth and abideth forever. Isn't that something? Peter says, he's inspired of God. He says, the word of God gave you your new birth. I thought it said, I thought John said you get the new birth by receiving Christ. Both statements are true. Stay with me. Here's another one. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Pilate made a mistake, a bad mistake. His judge, his, that governor was his judge, and he said, he was looking at Jesus Christ, and he said, what is truth? When Jesus was talking about the truth. He was looking at the truth personified. Because Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. But did you know in the very same book Jesus said that he's the truth? In John 17, 17, he said, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Isn't that something? You know why your preacher says, get in that book, get in the right one, make sure you know what book it is. Don't be careful, the devil's smart here in these last days. It's a, there's deception all over the place. Make sure you get in the right book. Get your nose in that book. Don't you get cobwebs on your Bible. Don't you get, you, you know, don't, don't, don't you get a dust on your Bible. Hey, man, read that thing. Wear that dude out and, and get in it. It's the only thing that will keep you going for God. The Word of God's the truth, but it says Jesus is the truth. He says, I'm the life. I'm the resurrection and the life, John 11. He says, you know, he that, he that hath the Son hath life, 1 John 5, 12. He that hath not the Son of God hath not life. It says in 1 John 5, 20, this is the true God, talking about Jesus and eternal life. But you know what it says in John 6, 63? The words that I speak, they are spirit and they are life. Wow. <laughs> I'll say that backwards. Wow! Hey, listen to me. Both of them are called life. You don't just, God don't just go throwing and running at those terms like that. You know how you get clean? You get clean by Jesus. Amen? He'll clean you when you get saved. Wash in his blood and he'll keep you clean. If you get back under that blood and you daily, stay in daily fellowship with him. When you mess up, get back up. Ask God to forgive you. Brush yourself off. Ask him to forgive you and, and put it under the blood and go on. 1 John 1, 7, and you know, the, uh, the blood of Jesus Christ, his son cleanseth us from all sin. How I many of y'all know the blood is what cleanses you? But wait a minute. What about Ephesians 5, 23, where it says, it talks about the wife, the husband and wife relationship. And it says the, uh, you, you, clean, you wash them and you, you cleanse them by the washing of the water by the word. It ought to be in every one of our homes. The Bible is the only thing that will keep your, 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 you clean, your wife clean, your kids clean. You ain't got a chance if you try to do this and miss that step. They both cleanse you. Jesus said in John 15, you're clean through the word that I've spoken to you. They both cleanse you. They're both perfect. I could give you the references. They're both holy. Jesus says in 1 Peter 2, Be ye holy. As he hath called you as holy, be ye holy as I am holy in all manner of conversation. But wait a minute. The Bible's called holy too. Not just because it has it on the cover. Do you got to check and make sure you know what's inside. But if you got the right Bible, it's holy too. We say only the originals are inspired. But we don't have anything around today that's perfect and pure and holy. Wait a minute. You know what he said in 1 Timothy 3.15? That, for, you know, in 16 it says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and it's profitable. Hey, you know what it says in 1 Timothy 3.15? Timothy, that from a child thou hast known the holy Scriptures. 
which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. He said, you are given that book and it's just as holy as the originals. How you like that? I'm going to let him preach on this, but I kind of like what I'm hearing. It fired me up. Don't you get tired of that? So many preachers don't take a stand on anything anymore. You don't know which Bible. Hey, listen to me. The Bible, it's holy, and Jesus Christ is holy. They're both pure. They're both pure. First John 3, he said, Beloved, it doth not yet appear what we shall. We're now we the sons of God. It doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, second coming, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And everyone that hath this hope in himself purifieth himself, even as he, talking about God, Jesus, is pure. How many of y'all believe that Jesus is pure? Boy, was he. Hey, and is he. Hey, but you know what David said in Psalm 119? Thy word is very pure, therefore thy servant loveth it. You say, Brother Reed, is this all your, your kids quoted the Scripture? Why don't you just start preaching? Is this all you're going to do, just give us Bible, 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 Bible? Well, he's the one that called me and asked me to do it. You blame it on him. He said, we need a Sunday revival. And I don't think from listening to his screaming and all that stuff on the Sunday night series, I don't think from listening to YouTube, he's talking about, re, you know, re-Bible like he needs a new one. The Bible don't need to be rewritten. It needs to be reread. So I'm just trying to follow the orders. Amen. Just get them out of him. I'm the good guy. Huh? Hey, listen to me. They're both pure. They're both holy. I can go on and on. The most hated person that ever lived in the world. I hate this. The thing about it is God and Jesus Christ. When people cuss, Get mad and ready to hurt somebody, kill somebody. You know what they do? They start using his name. His name is so powerful, they got to use his name when they're mad, when they're ready to hurt somebody. Hey, listen to me. They hate that name, but it's the most loved name ever was. There's 500 hymns in our hymn book about one person, Jesus Christ. Sorry, Elvis is not the king. Nobody writes any songs about Elvis. It's only been like 20 years, 30 years, you know, since he put my collar up, since he went, he kicked a bucket. Hey, listen, Jesus, they're still singing songs about Jesus. This is just one hymn book. They're singing 2,000 years after he's gone, we're singing about him. He's the most hated, or he, and he's the most loved. Listen to me. One day, according to 2 Corinthians 5, according to Romans 14, it says, we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. How many of y'all know that? One day, God, it says, God hath appointed his son, ordained his son, that he should judge this world. One day, God's going to say, you're going to tell me you can't do it? You're going to tell me you can't live right down there on that dirty planet called Earth? I'm going to show you somebody that did and review his life and show how he lived a perfect, sinless life for 33 years walking around on, down on this planet. And he says, matter of fact, I'm going to scoot over and let him be the judge. He's going to be your judge since he did it the way I've asked you to do it. How about that? We're going to stand before Jesus, amen? It's a scary thing when you think about it. It says we'll all stand before him. Then it says we'll all bow before him. And the Bible said then every one of us will confess to God. Interesting wording. Hey, listen to me. I know Jesus is going to be my judge. That scares me. It ought to put a little fear in your, your step too. Stay with me. But wait a minute. What did Jesus say in John 12, 48? He said in red letters, if you've got a red letter edition, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The words that I have spoken, the same shall judge him at the last day. Hey, I thought Jesus was going to be my judge. He is. Well, why does he say that the Bible is going to be your judge? His words are going to be what judge? Because they're going to be your judge. You see, they're both alive. In Revelation 1.18, he said, I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I'm alive forevermore, and have the keys of death and hell. How about that? He's alive forever. But you know what it says in Hebrews 4.12? The Word of God is quick. That means it's alive and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. And it's, it talks about discerning. It's a judge. The thoughts and intents of your heart. 
He knows. Hey, that Bible's alive. I could go on and on and on and give you Scripture, Scripture, Scripture about how the Word of God and Jesus Christ are both the same. Lester Roloff said it best. We need him back. He said, he said, the way you treat your Bible is exactly the way you treat Jesus. What are you doing with Jesus? And he turned around in his message and said, what are you doing with your Bible? And then he said, what are you doing with Jesus? I got the old cassette tape. It might have been real to real back when he was preaching. I don't know what they had back then. It, I mean, hey, listen, what are you doing with Jesus? And then he'd say, what are you doing with your Bible? What are you doing with Jesus? He said, the way you treat your Bible is the way you treat Jesus. And he said, he said, the Bible is Jesus. He said that. He said, this thing is Jesus. He said, you want to get Jesus? You got to get this Bible in your heart supposed to put Jesus in your heart, isn't he? But then David said, Thy word have I hid in my heart. That I'm, I'm not going to go that far and say what Roloff said, but I'm going to tell you, he's a ten times, I'm just going to put it like this, he's a ten times better Christian than I ever thought about being. And he's closer, I, he didn't hang the moon, but he's closer to the one that did than I'll ever be. So I'm going to put him up there way ahead of me. Hey, Lester Roloff's unbelievable. Hey, we need him back. And oh, by the way, he's from Texas. There's a couple people good from Texas. Roloff was from there, amen? Hey, listen to me. But Roloff, I, I'll tell you this. I sit down and think about it. What if that was Jesus? How, you treat, how do you treat Jesus? And then he said this. He said, what God does with you depends on what you do with your Bible. What you do with your Bible is what God's going to do with you. Man, I'm so stinking under conviction preaching this, man. The Bible says it's a sharp two-edged sword. I'm cutting on you, doing some surgery. Some of y'all, y'all are not shouting and saying amen anymore like you was a while ago. Y'all done gotten quiet on me like as quiet as a turkey farm on Thanksgiving afternoon, man. Y'all are quite, usually y'all are like going with me, amen and all this. Y'all got like quiet. They're like, what happened to you? But it's cutting me just like it's cutting you. You know what we need? We need to get back to the Bible. Roloff said this. This is, boy, this is a good one. He said, America is an insane asylum run by the inmates. He's the one that first said that, that we can trace it back to. They all trace it back to Roloff. He's an, America is an insane asylum run by the inmates. I wonder what he would think if he was around right now. And then he said, back to the Bible, or back to the jungle. Hey, man, I want God to do something in my heart. It's directly proportional to the intake of the Word of God. You need that Bible. You need to get that Bible. You need to read that Bible. We got a lady back in our church named Miss Virginia. She died about a year ago. Miss Janie knows her. We're hardly ever home, but we got to be home this spring. She's got red hair. My pastor, Dr. J.D. Weedo, he's got red, bright red hair. She said, I started coming because I kept hearing about this red-headed preacher. That caught, isn't it funny how God brings people, gets them in different ways? She come and she fit right in. She said, this is like the preaching was 50, 50 years ago. How would she know? She was 95 when she died last year. Miss Virginia read her Bible through 12 times a year on her last three years of her life. J.D., my, my pastor, Dr. Weedle, said, I get so stinking under conviction by that lady. She come in and said, I better be ready when I preach because that lady's been reading it. She's going through that thing once a month, once a month. And she's got, she's at 90, well, I can't see as good at no excuses for her. What's our excuse? We got 2020 vision or 2019 or, you know, a good pair of glasses and we got five or six Bibles laying around our house. What are you doing with your Bible? Boy, this is tough. But we need to get with our Bible. We need to get right with our Bible. We need to rededicate our lives to our Bible. You read it through? Good. Do it again. Do it again. It, it tells how much God's going to use you. There's no shortcuts. 
This ought to be the most Bible-reading church anywhere in New, Mex New Mexico. Amen? Guy, love the Lord. Thank God for our military men. He stepped on a landmine in Vietnam. Blew both of his legs off. Third degree burns on over 40% of his body. When you get there, you're probably not going to make it. And, and the worst thing for him was he went, uh, they blinded him. He, he went blind. And he got third degree burns on a lot of his skin. And, and when he got the medics, couldn't understand it, man. He was like hurting worse than anybody, you know. He's been around in a burn war. That's about as tough as it gets on this earth. And uh, but he, the other patients were complaining and all. He never complained. He hurt, but he never complained. And after a little bit, he'd always praise in the Lord, rejoicing in the Lord. And then, and then uh, one day he asked the nurse, three or four days in, he said, could you read the Bible to me? I know you're trying to help me and you're doing a great job. He said, but could you just read a chapter? Well, she got a Bible and read it, and he pretty soon had her reading like five chapters to her. He, every, every day she's, he's wanting more. Man, just one more. It ain't, you don't have to get a long one. And different ones would come in and read the Bible to him. He just loved that, comfort one another with these words. They were lost, most of them, you know. And we know what happened? They got tired of this guy. Man, I can't handle it. Doctors are saying, I don't know if they're supposed to be doing that legally, but, you know, that's what he says helps him comfort. And so they got a Braille Bible for him. And those things ain't cheap. Those things ain't free. And the race type and all that, and they got him some tapes or something to listen to to learn how to read the Braille Bible and study, you know, and you put your hand over that deal. And they brought that thing in there, and they, all of them got away, and they wanted to see what this guy was going to do. Is he going to come out of his bed? Is he, is he going to shout it out because he got him a Braille Bible? And boy, did he ever get happy. And man, I got my Bible. I love the Bible. And I got me a Bible. Y'all got me a Braille Bible. Why did y'all do that? And he said, yeah, we got you some tapes. I don't know how to do it. But put your hands over it and you'll feel the raised type. Well, he did. And when he did, he couldn't feel the type of the words. And they didn't check close enough or something because he had burns on his hands and on the skin on this side and, and he couldn't feel anything. And he said, finally, he said, man, I can't feel anything. They knew something was wrong. He said, I can't feel anything. And they said, well, that's how you've got to be able to read is with your fingertips. And he said, I can't feel anything on any of them. He said, this is a Bible? And, 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 they said, and, they, and finally, he said, oh, no. I've been praying this whole time to God to get me a Bible. I didn't know how he's going to do it. He gave me a Braille Bible, and he said, but I can't feel it. He said, would you let me just have my time alone with the Lord and my Bible before you take it back away and give it to somebody else? He said, I, 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 something's got to give here. I got. He wanted to pray, and they went to the edge of the room. He didn't know he was in the room. He started praying. Oh, God. You know I love the Bible. I can't read the Bible no more. I ain't got no eyes. And, Lord, I don't know why this all has happened to me, but, Lord, I love the Bible. I love it. And he reached down and picked that big Bible up and kissed it. And when he kissed the Bible, he felt it with his lips. I can feel it. I can feel it. And he, he kissed it. He felt it with his tongue. I can feel it with my lips. I can feel it with my tongue. And they were all standing over there, man, electrified. He said, y'all come back in here. Come back in here. I can feel it with my tongue. Let me have those tapes. I'll study it. Play. He said, I'll, I'll learn to read it with my lips. Those people were amazed. They watched that man learn how to read his Bible on those tapes. With, and he read it. He filled it with his lips and go across that race top just like that. It down every line. And the last they heard, he got released out of the hospital and got back to America. The last they had heard on that guy, he had read his Bible through four times all the way through with his lips and with his tongue. You know what we got? We got two good eyes. It's a huge obligation. It's a huge responsibility to have a Bible in your possession. We got four, five, six of them. We got New Testaments laying around. We just can't find time in that something. And that guy read it through four times, at least four times with his lips. I want to close. Take your Bible and look at Revelation chapter 5. A little boy came to Sunday school. and They need to be in junior church.
You know they do. You know why? Because they can't get it out here. They have a hard enough time getting it in there, but sometimes they get it better than we do. Listen close. Look at Revelation 5. I'm going to close with this. This little boy came to junior church. His dad should have brought him. But thank God for the bus ministry, amen. And he came and he heard the Bible and the gospel. And he went home and the next week he came back. I like it, Mom. They like me down there. And then Dad, and, and finally he came home about four weeks in. And he said, Dad, you ain't going to, what would you learn at, at church? He said, Dad, you ain't going to believe it. I learned at, at church today that God is left-handed. He said, what? Sweetheart, get in here. What are we sending it? What are they teaching our son? What would you say? He said, God's left-handed. That's what they taught us. And he said, I'm tired of this. I don't know about them hypocrites. He said, I, he called the church number. The pastor answered about two o'clock, got off the bus, got home, and, and boy, he was in trouble. You know, the pastor was in trouble. And the pastor's got it, you know, he's got it. The buck stopped with him. He handled, feels that phone call and said, Man's mad. He said, what are y'all teaching my son down there? He said, he's in first grade. He said, he, I've been trying to teach him how to write with his right hand. And they're saying that God's left-handed down there at your church. You bunch of idiot fanatics. Ain't, God ain't left-handed. That ain't in the Bible. He said, the preacher goes, no, I don't think it's in the Bible either. And he said, I, that, we didn't teach him that. He said, that boy got on the phone three-way. I don't know what they had. He said, Dad, Dad. He did. They taught it down there at that church. He said, you the pastor? Yes, I am. He said, let me four-way into the junior church director. Pass the buck, amen? He got him on the phone. He said, tell me, you didn't, this little boy came to your junior church, and he said that you taught in junior church that God's left-handed. I didn't teach that. <laughs> and that little boy popped up. He said, you sure did. You said it over and again in a message this morning that Jesus is sitting on the Father's right hand. So you said God's left hand. I didn't say that. They got to laughing that dad, that dad had been trying to teach that boy. He left handed. Trying to teach that boy how to write with a right hand in first grade, you know. And man, he was losing because of the church he sent him to. Huh? How many of y'all believe that Jesus is sitting at the right hand of God? Isn't that where he's at? They say it's all about location. I think he's in the perfect spot. Amen? But look at Revelation 5. I can't quote it right, get my kids to. I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the back side sealed with seven seals. Huh. What's that all about? Look at it. And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the thr uh, throne a book written within and on the back side sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who's worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof. And no man in heaven, nor on earth, nor under the earth was able, were able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And I wept much, because no man was found worthy to open the, and read the book, neither to look thereon. And then it gives the answer, Revelation 5.5. One of the elders said unto me, Weep not. Behold, the line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, had prevailed to open the book and to loose the seals thereof. What does that mean? Well, preachers argue, and I'm not going to argue. If everybody has their opinion, you're entitled to your opinion as long as you've got Bible to back it up. Amen? But they say, well, that's not the Bible. That's some other book. And that's the book of Revelation. I'm not going to argue with them about it. But you know what I believe that book is? It's in the right hand of God. It's just my opinion, so you can take it for what it's worth. It says there's a book written within. When you get to heaven in Revelation 4, right after you get up there, it gives a description of what's going to be like. And John got to see a little pregame heads up, warm up deal. He saw it ahead of time. And in Revelation 5, it says the people begin to stare at this book. They're staring at this book. They're singing about the blood. Read it. They're shouting about being saved. Read Revelation 4 and 5. And they're staring at a book. And that book is in somebody's right hand. And it says it's sealed in the, on the back side, sealed with seven seals. Now what's interesting is your King James Bible is the only one that doesn't have a copyright. If it would have had a copyright, England would have been a lot richer than the United States. They're pretty rich still. 
that they'd have been a lot more wealthy than the good old USA. But they didn't put no copyright on that Bible. So then you can just print it, put tracts out, and put scripture portions out, and the Bible's out all around the world, and they don't have to pay any royalties. Isn't that something? That's a good deal. That tells you something. And then the other thing about it is it's funny. Nobody knows why. But on the back side of our Bible, we got these little binding things. And there are like seven of them. I don't know if you have it on yours. Now, don't get scared and worried. Man, I ain't got the right Bible. But if you don't have this on yours, that don't mean you ain't got legit Bible. But on the top, I got one, two, three, four, five. But then there's six and seven at the bottom. Seven seals. Seven seals. How many of y'all raise your hand? Now, don't be scared. But raise your hand and say, on the back of my Bible, I didn't even know it, but it's got seven seals on the back. Would you raise your hand? Just slip your hand up. There's going to be a bunch of you in this. Okay. If you don't have that, don't worry. But the only version that does happens to be the King James. Seven of them. Sitting right there. And you know what I think it is? I think it may be the Bible. And if it is the Bible, guess what it's in? It's in the right hand of him that sits on the throne. That's God the Father's right hand. There's a book in his hand. Guess what about it? John said, I wept much. People say, you know, no, no tears in heaven. No, not after Revelation 21.1. But we're going to be in heaven a while before the great white throne judgment hits. And he said, no man in heaven or in earth or under the earth, that's the people in hell, is worthy to do one of three things. To look at it, to open it, or to read it. Did you see that? And he said, I wept because I couldn't, we couldn't find nobody to open that book. And then Jesus steps up. He's worthy. He's so holy and so pure. And he says, let me take care of this. He said, let me open. And he starts popping them seals. And then you see all hell break loose with the tribulation down here on the earth. If you know scripture, you know what's coming. It's bad stuff. Hey, listen to me. No man in heaven is worthy to look at this book or to read it. Open it or to read it, much less read it. You know what we think? We think, man, I ain't got time for my Bible. It don't deserve me. Wait a minute. We got this backwards. We don't deserve it. I know what these ma this mouth, these lips have said. I know in my past, I know what's gone through my brain. I know the things that I've done, even if you don't. God knows, and thank God for the blood of Jesus Christ. And I don't deserve to have a Bible. I don't deserve to have a perfect one. You know what we need to do? We need to get right with our Bible. We don't deserve it. We don't deserve it. 